Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. And welcome to Finnegan's webcast, Things Are Different Over There, Avoiding Misunderstandings and Pitfalls to Maximize Value When Prosecuting Patents on Both Sides of the Pond. My name is uh, Luigi Stefano, and I'm a European patent attorney based out of Finnegan's London office, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome our presenters, Michelle Bosch and Yelena Morozova. Uh, Michelle is a partner and a U.S. patent attorney based out of our Washington, D.C. office and leads the firm's chemical practice group, whilst Yelena is part of our electronics team and is a dual qualified U.S. and European patent attorney based out of our London office. Um, before I hand over to our presenters, uh, I invite everyone to participate by submitting questions. So this is intended to be an interactive webinar, and in order to submit a question, just click on the red Q&A button at the bottom of the webcast interface and type your question into the Q&A window, uh, then click submit. The questions will be answered today during the uh, question and answer session, which will take place at the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, you can enlarge the slide window at any time by clicking on the green enlarge window button on the top right side of the slide window, uh, and the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow webcast help guide button in the, located in the lower center of the webcast interface. Um, and now I'll hand over to Michelle and Yelena to begin our presentation. Things are different over there, avoiding misunderstandings and pitfalls to maximize value when prosecuting patents on both sides of the pond. Welcome Michelle and Yelena, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Luigi. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm Yelena, uh, and Michelle will join in a little bit later on the further slides. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, presentations that address differences between European and U.S. practices often focus on two or three main differences, such as other subject matter or obviousness, thereby leaving many other differences untouched. Uh, while this allows for a detailed discussion of specific differences, what often is left out how these differences uh, sit within the bigger picture of persecuting patent families that have patent applications on both sides of the pond. We thought it would be a good start for our webinar is to basically focus on the bigger picture, highlighting a greater number of differences and issues arising between the two jurisdictions and focusing on strategic implications of such differences. Some of the issues we are going to discuss, we uh, have been identified uh, partially in my personal experience as a U.S. practitioner who moved to London and learned to wear the hat of the European patent attorney. And while doing, them, tr doing that, trying to explain, demystify, and sometimes justify the U.S. way of things during the patent persecution to my European colleagues. So the slide that in front of you uh, quotes the greatest enemy of communication is the illusion of it. This quote highlights one of the reasons why sometimes the best possible result is not achieved when working with your colleagues across the pond. How often do you find yourself talking to your client, counsel, or colleague, thinking that you're on the same page only to find out down the line that what you meant was very different from what they understood you to say? Sometimes the consequences of this misunderstanding might be futile to secure a patent. How often do you feel like this boy in a picture when reading instructions or more often examiner's arguments in an office action issued by a foreign patent office? As an example, my European colleagues often expre express their extreme frustration when a U.S. examiner issues a restriction requirement that they perceive unfair or cites four or five documents uh, and find the claims to be obvious. Surely the fact that the examiner had to use four or five references to find claims obvious actually indicates that the claims are non-obvious, but that's not the case in the U.S. On the other side, uh, my U.S. colleagues often baffled when I have to tell them that a particular amendment they would like to pursue in Europe actually is not possible because it either has no basis or it reduces the subject matter that was not really searched. Their response is, surely there is basis, look, there is a paragraph and an application. It says basically the same as what I want to add to the claim. But that's not how it works in Europe. There are quite strict requirements. 
So from what I was able to observe, it's quite often that these frustrations and puzzlement, they come from the fact that an attorney in one jurisdiction is trying to understand what's happening in another jurisdiction through the prism of their local practice. Um, while it is natural for us to do so, it often prevents us to, from actually substantively addressing the issues. Another aspect that we should be aware of is cultural differences. So when you work with your international colleagues, their culture influences how they perceive what you tell them and their decision making. Uh, appreciating where they're coming from may help you to tailor your advice and at the end of the day be more effective. For example, um, you may know that Japanese people tend to avoid confrontation. And perhaps this is why, and due to not really fully understanding the options that are available for them and their consequences in the patent prosecution, particularly in the US practice, you may find that Japanese-based patent applicants tend to amend the claims more often than it's really justified or actually file for RC in the US instead of appealing the claims to, well, appeal would have been actually the better option. Um, Luigi uh, had an interesting real life story that he's going to share with us, which actually highlights appreciating uh, the importance of appreciating the cultural differences between the US and the UK and tailoring your advice accordingly. Thank you, Elena. So um, I recall um, at the beginning of my career as a patent attorney, um, I was working together um, with a U.S. patent attorney trying to prosecute uh, one of their applications in Europe. And uh, we'd uh, finally arrived at, um, we, we'd been issued with a summons to attend all proceedings. And the case was pretty hopeless. There was really no way we were going to convince, uh, overcome the patentability objections. The, argu the examiner's arguments were pretty watertight. And so I remember having a discussion with my boss and he said, okay, you know, we, we need to manage the U.S. attorney's expectations here and communicate to him really the, the utter futility in proceeding with an expensive hearing that was going to lead in refusal anyway. But my boss was concerned that he didn't want to appear defeatist to his U.S. colleague, so I remember him telling me that we needed to pick, we needed to quantify with a with a number um, what the likelihood of success was. But he didn't want to uh, to pick a number that was so low that it would seem defeatist. But at the same time, he didn't want to give his U.S. counterpart uh, any false hope. So I, I propose we should we should quantify the likelihood of success of five percent. But I remember my my boss thought that was way too way too low and would be perceived as being defeatist. So my uh, so my boss decided that twenty percent a twenty percent likelihood of success was 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 a much better figure because in his view it was it was sufficiently low to be to highlight the futility of continuing with the application, but not so low that it looked to be defeatist. So we, we composed our, our our email, we sent it off to the U.S. attorney, and I remember within two minutes we had a response, and the response was, and I quote, "Go for it." So so clearly in that in that case, our our intentions, despite you know we were using the same language, the, uh, the there was a complete miscommunication because the U.S. attorney perceived 20% as a relatively optimistic um, likelihood of success, and so uh, so. Our, our reporting letter was completely counterproductive. And so, you know, as expected, we go to the hearing and, uh, and it ended exactly as we expected and the case got refused. So, so that, that, that's my interesting antidote as to um, despite um, us Europeans and, and, um, and, and Americans using the same language, oftentimes there are differences in, in, in perception. And from my experience in general, Americans tend to be a little bit more optimistic, whereas in particular, um, some British colleagues can, can do, be a, a little bit more pessimistic. And so when, when providing your advice, you know, th th these are the kind of things that should also be considered. Thank you. So looking at Luigi's example, which illustrates quite well that although we speak the same language, uh, what we say might be perceived very different depending on what on one country you are. And that's particularly, um, not necessarily amusing, but might sound unusual because US and UK, both uh, countries speak the same language English, but actually the same word may mean different things. So if we are looking at the comment on the screen, if you were to draft an application 
describing a snack. According to the kid in the comic, the snack is a fruit. Uh, the snack is um, sweets, cakes, cookies. While according to his mom, it's actually fruit or veggies. A bit different. But what about, for example, chips? Uh, in the U.S., chips are actually sold in a bag. You typically have them in a pub or as a snack. In the U.K., chips are typically typically a company fish, and the look, taste, feel very different. So if you were to draft an application that describes chips or particularly claims, the result would be very different if you take the common meaning of the term in the US versus in the UK. The difference might be in the shape, texture, even color. But that's, you know, real life example. What about uh, the patent terms or legal terms? Um, as an example of the patent legal terminology is subject matter. Are you allowed to introduce new subject matter in Europe? What about the US? What does it actually mean in these jurisdictions? Um, okay, I'm, this is Michelle, and I'm going to go ahead and pick up here and start talking about some of the issues that, based upon upon what Elena and Luigi have mentioned, we've identified a couple of the more common issues that seem to raise these type of kind of questionable situations between European and U.S. practitioners. First topic um, we're going to talk a little bit about is new or added subject matter because this this concept certainly exists in both the U.S. and the European systems, but there are different implications. And it's true that they are similar in that uh, under both systems, new or added subject matter is not allowed when amending claims. And it's true that in both systems, um, both legal systems, amendments must generally find support in the original disclosure. And by original disclosure there, I mean both the original specification and claims. And so just a note there that both in the U.S. and in Europe, both systems allow the originally filed claims to provide support for an amendment since they form part of the original disclosure. So even if the same content is not identical in the specification, those original claims can provide support. However, when you compare the two systems in the US and Europe, they're similar, but when you look at their different perspectives on which amendments are allowed, the US is generally viewed as more permissive with respect to the um, uh, amendments that are allowed, and Europe, on the other hand, is perceived to be more strict with respect to answering whether the inquiry of whether or not there is support. In the U.S., we have the written description requirement of Section 112, and that does require that there's a description of the claim amendment sufficient to show that the inventors had possession of the claimed invention, and that inquiry is evaluated from the perspective of the ordinary skilled artisan. In Europe, on the other hand, the more strict the the the, the inquiry is more strictly answered, and um, the support requirement uh, appears to require something closer to literal support, not always verbatim support, but it, it's a more strict inquiry. And in my practice, I've heard it often phrased as the is the amendment unambiguously supported by the application. So we've got similar but two different standards. And on this slide, um, this shows some of the common amendments that, that come up during prosecution and the different ways that they're generally handled in the U.S. compared to Europe. Um, the red and green check or cross marks there on the right give you a quick sense that there are many more types of amendments that are allowed in the U.S. But having said that, each inquiry really is a fact-specific inquiry with respect to the specific claim language you're evaluating for the amendment compared to the language in the specification. And this slide is not to suggest that the U.S. is a yes jurisdiction for all claim amendments, because that's certainly not true. Um, yes, many of these types of amendments are theoretically allowed, 
but probably the most accurate thing that we can say is that the U.S. requirements for support are more flexible than Europe's, and they give applicants a little bit more opportunity to maneuver. Um, I want to comment. I'm going to walk through each of these quickly um, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about and some of the differences. But first, with respect to rewording of a passage, this this relates to an amendment really to the specification, and it's often seen when there's a translation involved. In the U.S., um, you know, a literal translation with no correction for uh, – well, in the U.S., a literal translation with no correction for context is not what is required. You do need to have a certified translation, but the U.S. does allow, in circumstances, revisions for clarity that will not be deemed to destroy priority. Um, having seen amendments to translations or, or making amendments to a translation to make it read better, this is something that is often accepted, not always, um, but is often accepted. You know, as a practice note, um, I have seen it, but it's not something that you necessarily, that I would advise um, in that uh, amendments to the translation, uh, especially to a certified translation, pose risks because the ultimate consequence could be the loss of priority if it's challenged. Um, in Europe, uh, it, it's been my experience, experience that such amendments simply are not allowed. Um, and so there's a there's a difference there, and oftentimes a surprise by European practitioners um, that that is something that uh, is allowable under certain circumstances in the U.S. Um, with respect to inclusion of a dictionary or an art recognized definition that is known at the time of filing in the application, in the U.S. it is possible to amend claims to recite a dictionary or art recognized definition that is known at the time of filing although not expressly mentioned in the spec. My understanding, this is not allowed in Europe. Um, to, to be able to make that type of amendment in the U.S., you do need to provide evidence um, that it is an art-recognized term so that the ordinary skilled artisan would understand what is meant. Um, to the inherent, or making an amendment to cover or recite an inherent function theory or advantage. In the U.S., this is something that an applicant can theoretically do during prosecution, um, since the function theory or advantage is not expressly recited in the application, the applicant would need to establish its presence with evidence that the examiner deems to be sufficient to prove that that inherent feature um, uh, or the inherent presence uh, in the specification of that feature. The evidence is going to have to show in that case that the function theory or advantage or whatever the claim amendment is, is necessarily and inevitably present in the specification. This type of evidence usually gets submitted via um, a 132 declaration. In similar, or I guess in contrast, this practice would not be allowed in Europe um, because it's a, a lack of an express disclosure or a lack of disclosure of the, the inherent feature. Um, incorporation by reference, this is another tool that is allowed in the U.S. Um, with some limitations regarding essential elements, but um, description that has been included in the specification by incorporation by reference can theoretically be added to a claim. In most situations, the examiner will issue a rejection that's going to need to be overcome. In contrast, this uh, it's, been my, it's my understanding of the law that this is not allowed um, in Europe. Uh, the next two, cherry picking and combining features from separately, depend, uh, separately dependent claims into one claim. Um, this is something that is often utilized in the U.S. and mentioned as a stark difference with Europe. Uh, cherry picking certainly means, uh, to me means that you're selecting to claim one member of a group or a few from a disclosed group and then claiming them as a subset. Generally, that's allowed because the express description is found in the specification. Sometimes that selection is rejected as not uh, sufficiently described as a subset, but at the same time, that is often an amendment that's accepted in the U.S. Um, same philosophy ap applies really to combining features from two dependent claims when you're combining them into one. Often the express written description is sufficient to allow the amendment in the U.S., but sometimes the examiners are more strict and won't allow um, the amendment because the combination is not described as an option in the specification. In Europe, um, as I understand, these types of amendments are only allowed when an advantage is disclosed. 
as associated with the selection of the combination. Otherwise, they're not allowed. And then finally, as noted, um, both Europe and the U.S. allow for correction of obvious areas in the specification, but an explanation is required, and the the explanation or the choices cannot be am, cannot be ambiguous. It needs to be an unambiguous correction being made. Um, on this slide, this is kind of an example of some of the claim amendment, um, uh, the cherry picking, and the com combining of dependent claims into one claim. And uh, at, at the top, we show there, uh, for example, three original claims, a device comprising elements A and B, a dependent claim, the device of claim one further comprising C, and then the device of claim two further comprising D and E. And then supporting those claims is a description with a device comprising A and B and further comprising G and H. And so considering what amendments could be made in the U.S. versus in Europe, Simply by looking at those those examples, there Europe has much fewer fewer amendments that likely could be made. Um, uh, presenting a claim to A, B, and C that's, that provide that finds support in original claim two, shown at the top. Um, a, B, C, D, E finds support in claim three, and then the final example there, A, B plus G and H, that that finds support in the specification. And so there is clear and somewhat literal support for each of those amendments. Beyond that, likely not many of the amendments that you see shown on the left that would be allowed in the US, many of those are not allowed in Europe. And so in the US, you see that there are many more permutations of those disclosed elements that, that are allowed. And maybe just as an example, if you look at the bottom row there, in the US, the, what, what I would call maybe cherry picking the combination of A, B uh, from claim one and then pulling element D from claim three, not including E and not including C, which, which would otherwise be within um, the full scope of dependent claim three, uh, that would be allowed. You can cherry pick a, an element from claim three and add it to claim one in that sense. And similar with A, B, and E, there again, you're cherry picking one of the elements. And additionally, the third option there on the final row, A, B, D, and E, here you're combining the elements of claims one and three without including the interim dependent claim C. And though, even though um, we all know that this difference exists, this difference between Europe and the US exists, you know, for, for this webinar, one of our goals is to be able to highlight this is a, one of the differences and this is one of the issues that can be spotted um, that our goal is to show you that for those of you that are in Europe, that this is an opportunity for uh, a, an advantage to be pursued for your clients in the U.S. And for those of you that are, and well, and for your U.S. counsel should be, should be asked to be able to provide some guidance with respect to what additional claims might be able to be presented in the U.S. And then on the flip side, for those of you that are in the U.S., when you provide your U.S. claim set, which may have many more um, dependent claims shown to, to European Council and ask for, as Yelena had mentioned earlier, ask for a claim set to be pursued in Europe and the claim set comes back significantly reduced, here's the reason why, and communicating with European Council to see if alternative claims exist that might be able to be su substituted could be pursued. Yelena? Okay. So, uh, yes, um, before we move to this slide, I wanted to add a couple of uh, points to what Michelle was discussing. So, uh, as Michelle explained, we are trying to highlight just because those tools are available in the U.S., we don't necessarily mean that they're appropriate every time. It depends on specific circumstances of the application. But also um, in the context of strategy, so as Michelle mentioned, is don't just blindly move, take one claim set in one jurisdiction and pursue it in another jurisdiction. Because if you start with the claim set that's in Europe and you pursue it in the US, um, other than the multiple dependencies, you're probably going to be okay. But doesn't mean that uh, the the best interest of the client I served. That depends. If the goal is to align two jurisdictions, yes. But if the goal is actually to get as broad a claim as possible, then maybe not. So kind of stop and think. Um, by the same token, if you are a US practitioner who sends instructions to European Council, don't be surprised when you receive back a response that US claims cannot be pursued in Europe. 
your best bet is going to be is identify what the invention is about, what features are commercially important, tell that to European counterpart and ask them to help you to draft the claims that address all of those issues and address all objections. Uh, one more point on incorporation by reference. As Michelle pointed out, uh, that's a tool that's available to you in the US, but not in Europe. On the same point is, if you start drafting in Europe, don't shy away from actually incorporating by reference something if that's not critical for the application you're drafting, but you think there is a chance it might be helpful in the US. Because at the end of the day, it, that's something that might save your claims in the US in the critical circumstances. So just because the tool is not available in your own jurisdiction, knowing that it is available in the US and it might be helpful, consider using it. By the same token, if you're drafting in the US and you're thinking, oh, I would incorporate this by reference, but maybe it's critical, make sure you include the express passages in the description, rather in specification, rather than trying to rely on incorporation by reference down the line, which might or might not work, and it might work only actually in the US. Um, now moving to the slide that we have in front of us, um, this, the idea of this slide was to try to show the differences as to what claims you can get as a result of the prosecution in both jurisdictions. So if you start with uh, Green Circle claims as filed and claims as searched in both offices at the starting point, generally speaking, in Europe, you would not be able to go outside that circle. So you can narrow the claims by adding additional features that relate to the inventive concept that's being searched, but you would not be able to change the direction of the claims. In the US, it depends on circumstances, but broadly speaking, and in extreme circumstances, you actually might be able to get a completely different set of claims compared to the starting set of claims, particularly when you uh, file a request for continued examination. But on the more average approach, there is um, more fluctuation as to where, in what directions you can take your claims in the US compared to Europe. Again, uh, think strategically how that can help your client because sometimes taking your claims in a particular direction that you can do in the US is the only way to actually get something allowed. So just because you're stuck in Europe and there is nowhere to go where the only option might be to file a divisional if that's an option, in the US you still might be to do more or be able to do more before you resort to filing a divisional application. Um, additional point I was going to make here is due to the differences between uh, the claim draft, and, and let's look at the next slide. So standard application, uh, in a standard filing fee, in the US you have uh, three independent claims included, 20 claims total. In Europe, you have 15 claims total, one independent claim, claim category with some exceptions. Uh, single dependencies in the US, multiple dependencies in Europe. So because of the nature of initial claim set, what you are able to do in the US is to have a couple independent claims in the same category with slightly different scope to see how the search results are, come out, whether one is better than another. However, doing the same in the Europe might actually pose pose problems down the line because we have a restriction that we can have only one independent claim per category with some exceptions like when you have interrelated um, components, transmitter and receiver. So um, by having two independent claims in the same category, you run the risk of the examiner finding those claims in the best case, um, best case just unclear, in the worst case as being non-unitary related to different inventions. And if that's the case, and you're invited to pay the additional search fee, and you say, no, I'm not going to do it, later on, you might have a problem when you try to incorporate features related to non-search subject matter. Because what you're doing, you're giving the examiner a tool to go look at the claims that were unsearched, and as soon as he or she sees the features that are cited in those unsearched claims, he or she can come back to you and say, this feature is unsearched, you're not allowed to put it in your claims, and then you'll have to go file a divisional application. 
Um, additional point about multiple claims, multiple dependency and single dependency claims. So if we were to go for a second to our example that we have discussed previously, if original claim set here, claim three was dependent on claim two or claim one, assuming the description simplification allows but that it doesn't contradict anything, then the possible uh, combinations on the APO side would have been improved because if you have claim three that can depend just on claim one, combination of A plus B plus B plus E would have been allowed and C would not have been required, unlike as it's currently presented on the slide. Um, one more point before uh, we move on is that multiple dependencies, um, they genuinely tend to help with prioritizing the features. So um, our recommendation would be if you draft an application that even has minimal chances going outside the US, start drafting claims as multiple with multiple dependencies because it would force you to think what is more important, what is combinable, how it works together. And then, even if you just file in your application in the US, we recommend at least include those claims with multiple dependencies as closes, sentences, or something similar in the description and the specification at the end. Does it guarantee that you will be able to pursue those claims? No, but you're much better positioned that you will be able to, because the additional requirement would be that actually those claims should be enabled, but at the very least, you will have the literal support. Um, the next step um, to mention is that how the claims are interpreted during the persecution by USPTO in the APO. Broadly speaking, uh, this slide illustrates that the U.S. examiner would look at the terms in the claims much broader than the European examiner would look. Although the description of what they might need to do is relatively similar, but the examiner at the U.S. Patent Office will look very broadly, while the European examiner will focus on what the inventive concept is and how it relates, what the relevant field is. So don't be surprised when you have your U.S. application uh, receiving an objection and you see the art that you perceive as being non-relevant. Actually, that art might be relevant if the terms in the claim are interpreted more broadly. Um, now we're going to talk about persecution processes as a whole comparing EPO and USPTO. Michelle? And so this slide here depicts really the European process across the top and then the U.S. process across the bottom. And the big takeaway from this is that the European process is a more linear pathway, um, whereas the U.S. prosecution process can be described probably as more cyclical at times in view of the ability to effectively start over or get a few more bites at the apple or a few more opportunities before the examiner via an RCE. Um, the, the processes are comparable in that the, it, on the European side, you have your search opinion examination report and you ultimately get over to a decision of either um, a either your, I guess, summons to oral proceeding or you've got a notice of allowance. But even if you go to oral proceedings, ultimately you're headed towards appeal. You know the next step there unless all of your claims are allowed via oral proceeding. Compare that with the U.S. where you've got a comparable first or non-final office action, which is really similar to that search, opi search and opinion, and then you've got a final office action in most cases. Um, you may have a second non-final, but nonetheless, you have probably two or three uh, office actions before you get to the point where you've, you have a final office action. And here, you have a decision point that's, I guess, different in comparison to Europe because you can um, move on to you know, your final office action. You might be able to respond to that either with an amendment or arguments that put the case in condition for allowance and you receive a notice of allowance, or um, you may not be effective there and receive an advisory action. So whether or not you have an advisory action after a final office action or you simply have a final office action, 
you have, a, you have an opportunity at that point in the U.S. to be able to file an RCE to continue prosecution of those pending claims, or you can amend the claims um, with really within the scope of the examiner's search, but you can file an RCE and move the application back before the examiner. Um, uh, it, it requires a fee. Certainly you are effectively buying more time with the examiner, but you are able to put the application with your claims back before the same examiner for further consideration. Um, in that sense, there, I guess there's really no limit to the number of RCEs that you can file. Nonetheless, at some point that becomes non-productive, but you can see how this becomes a potentially cyclical, potentially ongoing conversation, perhaps with amendments involved, perhaps with only arguments, but you can continue the conversation before the examiner. Um, another alternative in the U.S. at this point is you could, instead of filing an RCE, if you want to change the claims, let's say you were pursuing composition claims, you no longer want to continue to prosecute those and you're going to move, change the claims to method of treatment claims, you can, instead of filing an RCE, you can file a continuation application in the U.S. at that point and obtain a new search, but continue the process before the examiner. Um, so comparatively, those are different. The U.S. process can go on and on and on discussing the same claims, whereas in Europe, you get your really two bites at the apple and then you are forced to um, you know, the, the application really is over, either allowed or um, not. This slide shows uh, in more detail there some of the options that are available in the U.S. for after final practice to give you a sense of how many things you can do after final um, that arguably continue prosecution. Um, uh, the response to file an office action, you can substantively respond to that final office action. You can make remarks at that point. You could uh, amend your claims at that point and get them back before the examiner. The after final consideration program, pilot program is another opportunity to get remarks before um, the examiner. It's a special consideration program. You also have a pre-appeal brief conference where you file certain remarks and you get uh, insight from a, a panel on the appeal board as to whether or not your appeal is ripe. Uh, if it's not, you can continue back into prosecution. You can directly pursue an appeal brief, get it before a board of examiners, uh, one of them being the examiner that was in charge of the case, or you can, as, as I mentioned, continue prosecution, kind of go back, pay a fee in both these cases, and get claims back before the examiner. Um, I, I, I wanted to note that um, in, in the U.S., there is also, you have the opportunity to file a divisional. However, I have not mentioned that here because that really is a separate opportunity for pursuing subject matter um, that was restricted via a restriction requirement. And I think on this, yeah, I'm going to move right on to the topic of, we've called this divisional applications because I think that is what is most familiar to most European practitioners, but both the EPO and the USPTO allow for divisional applications, but they're two different types of applications. Um, in the EPO, uh, as I would explain it, um, a divisional application contemplates really, it, it's a continuing application to separate subject matter, and it's a more general term. Whereas in the US, we have several different types of continuing applications. One of those is a divisional, and that divisional is a specific kind of continuing application um, reserved for pursuit, as I said, of subject matter that was the subject of a restriction requirement. Um, in that case, a, a U.S. divisional uh, is, is for purposes of pursuing subject matter that can be pursued of right in that divisional application because it was restricted out of your original application. The U.S. also has a straight continuation application. Um, which essentially is what uh, in Europe uh, you all would call a voluntary divisional. And then we also have continuations in part where the specification has been added to um, compared to its parent. The take home really is that um, to know that these are different application types and to make sure that the communication that you are having with your counterpart either in Europe or in the U.S., to make sure that you're discussing the same types of applications for strategies, because you'll hear um, at, as we talk a little bit more about divisionals is there's a lot of different costs involved 
at this point, one of one additional um, type of application that I'd like to mention, and I, I don't have it on the slide right now because it was raised uh, by um, one of the questions that we had received, but one additional type of application that is available in the U.S. and, and is unique to the U.S. is what we call a bypass continuation. Um, and, and what that application is, is it is a U.S. continuation application, and it's filed at the national stage entry instead of a 371 national stage entry. So you have a PCT application that you're going to enter the U.S. in, and so instead of filing a 371 national entry, or perhaps in addition to, but you would file a, a, a what we call a bypass continuation. And it must be filed by that national stage entry deadline into the U.S., but it effectively is a U.S., a straight U.S. continuation application, and it's subject to U.S. application rules. It is not a national stage application, and it's not subject to the PCT provisions. They're not as common nowadays as they used to be, but they are available. Um, I, I often see them, or when you see them come up, is when um, an applicant uh, that has filed a PCT application expects that that application will benefit from U.S. restriction practice, maybe more than um, unity of invention type requirements. And so the choice is made early on to pursue that path, take the um, likelihood that a restriction will be uh, uh, issued, and it's just another available application that often comes up between Europe and the U.S. Yelena, you want to talk a little about divisional? Yes. So, um, as Michelle mentioned, one of the differences is type of applications that are available to you in both jurisdictions, one versus multiple in the Europe versus multiple types and the U.S. Another big difference is how much you have to pay in order to file a divisional application. So, in the U.S., you have no renewal to maintenance fees until the grant. And as such, when you file a divisional continuation or continuation in part, you pay the regular fees as you would pay filing just an application. That's not the case at the EPO. At the EPO, you have to pay if you file a divisional application of uh, extra stage starting with the second one. So let's say you have a grandparent relationship or grand grand great great grandparent relationship then you have to pay additional fees for that and also you have to pay back pay renewals based on the first application in the family this can adapt quite a bit so as an example uh looking at the date we had the great grandparent filed in 2002 we had grandparent 2007 7 2012 and then finally we filed a child application today USPTO, nothing really different. You, f you pay the same fee as usual. At the APO, in addition to regular filing fees, you pay for third generation traditional application and renewals for 14 years, which are based on the great grandparent, which was filed in September 2002, which adds up to quite a bit. So while the practice that in the U.S. is quite appropriate where you try to keep at least one application alive, so as soon as you receive an allowance, you file uh, one more application just to keep the family going, it's not as common in Europe because it is expensive. And while some companies may afford it and it's in their interest to have a family alive, for example, if a potential infringer comes along, it's not often possible. So one of the uh, issues we have noticed that sometimes you receive instructions from the U.S. Council who is not particularly familiar with the practice of divisional applications in Europe, and he or she says, go ahead and file a divisional application. At that point, we actually stop. We go on back and explain how much it's going to cost because not every client will be able to afford or interested in doing that. Because of that, the strategy of getting allowance might differ. So, for example, in the, if in the U.S. you receive suggestions from an examiner, say make that amendment and you receive a grant, more likely than not, you're going to accept it and file a divisional. Again, it's all client-specific. In Europe, you're less likely to accept it because if you see that the examiner actually wrong and you would be able to receive uh, a broader scope. Uh, claims of a broader scope. So just kind of strategical consideration, money do play uh, in this particular scenario. Um, now going to talk about 
obviousness versus inventive step. So um, what you have in front of you, obviously, are uh, just recitations from the statute in both jurisdictions. One of the differences, and I do think it plays alone in how things are evaluated, is that in the U.S., the statute phrased as a condition for non patentability while in ETC, which is applied by the EPO, it's actually conditioned for patentability. So it's kind of negative versus positive. And in my view, that affects how uh, uh, both jurisdictions actually approach the evaluation process. Um, additionally, one of the differences is actually what prior art plays into determination whether something is obvious inventive in one jurisdiction versus another. So, for example, in Europe, earlier filed by later published European patent application are excluded from the inventive step analysis, and they are not going to affect uh, patentability of your claims at that stage. While at the U.S., in most circumstances, that's going to be a full prior art, and therefore you have to deal with different scope of the prior art when you try to have your claims granted. Um, Michelle now going to address a little bit more on this topic on the differences. Thank you. Sorry about that. I was still on mute despite everyone telling me. Um, as Elena just said, both of these analyses um, involve the perspective of a skilled artisan, but that person over time has evolved really to be a different, and, and likely was intended to be, but has, is a different type of person um, under the law in the U.S. and in Europe. And that may explain some of the, the different analyses that are undertaken. And so comparing them in the U.S., the person of ordinary skill in the art is a, a hypothetical person who is presumed to have known and really be aware of the relevant art at the time of the invention. That person is not an expert in that relevant art, but is a person of ordinary creativity um, and, and uses their thought processes. Um, and is that person is able to combine the teachings of multiple patents together, like the pieces of a puzzle. And yes, that can be five plus pieces of prior art that, uh, for example, could be included in a rejection from the U.S. examiner. Compare that with the the person, the skilled person in for the European Patent Office. Their skilled person is a notional skilled practitioner in the relevant field of technology of the invention that has average knowledge and ability. He or she is presumed to be aware of common general knowledge in the art and is able to combine two teachings to solve a particular technical problem, not three or more. And so while the inquiry for the respective examiners is made, it is a similar inquiry made under the two legal systems, the vantage point from which the prior art ends up being viewed and the abilities of that person are different, which result in different, first of all, different re uh, rejections being made, but then also often different outcomes following the analysis. Finally, um, uh, with respect to this, this discussion of non-obviousness and the inventive step, the most significant difference, I think, in the two legal inquiries is the burden that needs to be carried by the examiner when making either an obviousness rejection in the U.S. or a lack of inventive step in Europe. And both of these are, are, are based in the law and based upon the statute. But in the U.S., for the examiner, he needs to set forth a prima facie case of obviousness. And to do that, what he or she uh, is required to do is to determine the scope and content of the prior art, ascertain the differences between the claimed invention and the, and the prior art, and then resolve what level of ordinary skill in that art is using the skilled artisan definition that we just talked about. And then the examiner must ask whether that claimed invention would have been obvious to that ordinary skilled artisan after consideration of all the facts. And then the examiner's rejection, uh, the art relied upon, the, the claim, each claimed feature of the claims must be identified in the cited art. And then the reason for combining those references needs to be stated. It needs to have a rational underpinning in the cited references. And it needs to be plausible. So given that burden in the U.S., and then we'll take a look at the European side, but given that burden, what you see in the U.S. is that 
that, that there's a traditional really two-step approach to responding to that type of rejection um, if you believe the rejection to be erroneous. And so you'll see an applicant first argue that the examiner has failed to meet this burden and to provide the reasons why. And then if the rejection is maintained, the applicant then the, the applicant then goes on to present arguments and evidence that attempt to rebut the prima facie case. Um, so first to attack the prima facie case, and then if that is not successful, oftentimes the applicant turns to rebutting that prima facie case, and then even if the applicant continues to disagree with the prima facie case. Um, Yelena, you want to talk a little bit about the European side uh, of that? Yes. Sure. So um, Europe has take a little bit different approach. And um, while I'm not completely sure about the burden, objectively speaking, from the practical standpoint, because U.S. has um, sort of circular process that we have discussed, and Europe has more linear process, in Europe we don't have as many opportunities to go back and forth. So typically just um, challenging all the comments made by the examiner is not going to advance the case. You need to help the examiner to actually grant your application, which means we have to uh, present positive arguments and using uh, the problem solution approach that is preferred by the ATO. The problem solution approach is, is in a sense, a fiction because when you draft an application, you don't know what uh, prior art document is going to be perceived as the closest prior art document. So you might not be able to in advance address the arguments that you'll have to make later on in time. So how does it work? You, the examiner identifies something that's the closest prior art. So for example, something that discloses most of the elements in the claim and also in the same field. Then uh, there is an identification of the features that are not present in that piece of art. Then we have to look what those features add to the inventive concept. What are the technical advantages? And we formulate the problem in view of those features, and then the argument is made whether the skilled person in the art would have arrived to the claimed invention starting from the closest prior art, whether just based on its own or another cited document. Um, so it's a little bit strange in a sense, particularly when I came from the US side of things to the European side of things. It took me a while to appreciate how do you actually use that tool to argue positively for your uh, claims because it seems it's some kind of requires some kind of imagination. You get into that, but the idea is that how you phrase the problem in the, and how you identify the advantages may help you quite a bit with the arguments you make. And the practical outcome of that is actually in Europe the inventive step genuinely speaking, it's easier to overcome the obviousness than the obviousness uh, rejection in the US. Uh, one small comment on uh, computer implemented inventions. So unlike with the other inventions where the technical advantages don't necessarily need to be disclosed in the application file, in the computer implemented inventions, you have much more, you're in a much more difficult position, and you need to have those described in an application as filed, otherwise you are not going to get anywhere. Um, considering the time, we're now going to address some of the general uh, points, perhaps some of the tips. Um, I think one of the important things is just to accept that UCTO and EPO are two different offices that, despite sometimes using the same terms, actually approach things in a different manner. So while it's the same game, the same goal, but the rules are different, therefore apply different strategies. Don't just try to use one strategy in one office and automatically apply it in another. It might not work, and even if it works, it might not be to the best advantage of the final claim. Um, another point is allow and attract your colleagues across the pond to do their job. Provide them with the necessary tools, explanation, what you're trying to achieve, but help them to help you to get the best claims possible under the circumstances. Um, additionally, um, depending on who you work, it, it, sometimes it pays off to ask questions. Make sure you understand why things are done in a certain way. If something doesn't make sense, 
you know what? Ask the question because it might not say, make sense to someone else. Don't just blindly follow that instructions you have received. So an example as the divisional, if you are not ch challenging your counterpart, are you sure you want to follow divisional because that's how much it's going to cost? At the end of the day, that counterpart might be in trouble with their client because they have not appreciated how much it's going to cost and you already spent the money. Um, be aware and appreciate the differences. So be aware of possible problems arising, try to issue spot them ahead of time. At the same time, make sure to use the differences between the two jurisdictions to your advantage. Uh, because that can help you to have better claims in each jurisdiction, although they might not necessarily be the same. Uh, Michelle, do you have anything to add before we move to questions? I don't. I think you covered everything there. I think that was very very thorough. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Michelle and Yelena. Uh, that was very interesting. So um, before we begin the question and answer portion of, uh, of our webinar, uh, I'd, I'd like to please ask everyone if you can take a moment to complete our brief evaluation survey. So uh, I, as we strive to provide um, programs of value and continually improve, we would really appreciate your input, which will help guide us in planning future programs. So, uh, so now we can uh, transition to the uh, to the Q and A portion of the webinar. And um, I have to say, um, we, we've received a, a lot of questions um, both before the webinar and also now during the webinar. And uh, unfortunately, I think given the volume of questions we received, we're not going to have time to answer all of them. So, what I'll try to do is prioritize the questions we've received during the actual webinar, and then, time permitting. Uh, we'll try to address some of the questions that were sent to us beforehand. So um, to to begin with, um, one of the questions that uh, that we received during the web webinar um, reads as follows. Um, so after US non uh, after a US non-provisional application is filed, be but before it is published, new data is generated for certain compounds broadly covered in the non-provisional application, but which were not specifically recited. In a U.S. continuation in part application, uh, excuse me, let me rephrase. So a U.S. continuation in part application may be filed. What about in Europe? Are there any differences if, you, if a U.S. non-provisional was published before new data was obtained? So, um, um, Yelena, Michelle, does, 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 do you have any thoughts on that? Would you like me to repeat the question? No, I, I no, just found it here. Um, I, I'm happy to, to take a, a stab at a little bit of that. So you filed a U.S. – you have new data on compounds that are generally described in a non-provisional. So you file a CIP. What happens in Europe? Uh, maybe Elena can answer that con that that question because um, uh, yes, you can file that in the U.S. You can file a CIP in the U.S. Um, assuming, I mean, presumably you have some data that show that those more specifically defined compounds that there's a basis for um, their, you know. Uh, Separate patentability. If not, you're going to end up where you've, you know, you are. Those two applications are related, and you will have a likely eternal disclaimer there. But you will be able to present those claims in the U.S., and you can get more specific, more specific claims, uh, presuming patentability. Uh, Elena, you want to comment a little bit on what you're going to be able to do in Europe? I mean, uh, as you mentioned before, CIP. Uh, continuation part application is very specific to the U.S. Europe doesn't allow for that. So, I mean, the question is, when did it happen? If, the, if this happened uh, within the one-year grace period, then you have an opportunity to uh, claim priority under the Paris Convention to file a subsequent application. Obviously, uh, only the old information is going to be entitled to the earlier priority date. Um, if you file, if you are beyond the 12 month period, then you would have to file a new application that cannot claim priority to the previous one. But as I mentioned earlier, one of the differences between the U.S. and Europe that uh, earlier filed but later published application is only a piece of art for the novelty purposes and not for the inventive step. So that kind of helps you to secure some additional developments down the line 
uh, is known as what you're claiming is different, not necessarily inventive, and the prior application has not yet been published at the time of filing of your subsequent application. Hope that answers the question. And, and then, if I may, I might address the final part of the question, which was if the U.S. non provisional was published before the new data was obtained, then I think you have a much more difficult situation because you're going to need to be, your own art is going to be prior art against you. Um, even if you file the CIP, it's new content, so you're going to have to demonstrate separate patentability in that case. So that is more complicated if your original application, in which discloses the compounds generically, is already published. Okay. Th th thank you both for that. Um, so hopefully that answers um, that, that question. So I'll move on to, to, to the next one. Uh, one of the questions we received uh, related to slide 22. So maybe we can just transition to that quickly. Um, I will. So in relation to slide 22, we've been asked. So uh, regarding the U.S. versus European position for non-obviousness inventive step, can you generalize by saying the bar with respect to non-obviousness inventive step is higher in the U.S.? So, um, this is Michelle. I, I don't know that you. I don't know that you can necessarily say that. Um, I think uh, you know it, it depends on the examination, and um, you know the art as to. You know, I guess what I would say with respect to the higher quality patent being issued in the end. Yeah, I mean, um, from my experience, I think. Um, um, what, what, what I've noticed is, I mean, the, the way inventive step is assessed is fundamentally different. So despite the fact that um, the person skilled in the art is free to mosaic more documents together in the U.S., that doesn't necessarily mean that the inventive step hurdle is easier to, or is harder to overcome in the U.S. Um, I think from, from my experience, what I know is they're just fundamentally different approaches to assessing inventive step. Um, and certainly the motivations for how prior art can be combined are different the way both um, both the U.S. and the EPO consider that. So um, certainly from my, my experience, I, I, I don't think you can der der derive that conclusion that inventive step is uh, harder to overcome in the U.S. And I think a lot of Europeans might feel that it's the other way around. But then again, I think ultimately it just comes down to their different um, different systems. Um, Elena, do you have that? any thoughts Yeah, so I mean, I think there are certain circumstances where the inventive step is going to more likely result in a patent than corresponding um, circumstances in the U.S. because of the nature of the problem solution approach and you have to fit your arguments within there, but it also restricts the examiner how he or she has to respond. However, as a general rule, no, uh, I think you're both right. It's two different approaches. Therefore, it, it really depends on the particular circumstances. Um, I think generally what sometimes happens due to the nature of different approaches, you more often to see the claims granted in the U.S. that have features that would not be perceived as being related to inventive concepts in Europe. Because in Europe, the inventive step analysis focuses on what the invention that was searched at the initial stage, whether that's inventive. And you don't necessarily add features to the claim that have nothing to do with that. While in the US, sometimes it's a valid way to overcome a rejection because in order for the obviousness argument, prima facie case to be made by the examiner in the US, he or she has to present the documents that disclose each feature. And sometimes the easier way, the easiest way and appropriate under circumstances way to overcome it is to add an additional feature from the description that not necessarily relates to inventive content, but allows you to push back on the examiner and force him or her to do further search and find another document. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. So moving on to our next question then. Um, Um, is it possible to file a bypass continuation before uh, application before normal entry after before normal national phase entry after uh, after the PCT phase has expired? After the PCT phase has expired, um, but let me. Yes. I thought I read the question slightly differently, so let me just read it here quickly, oh, and then I think sorry, this will be no, our I, last. 
I, I think I have misread it. I mean, I, I should correct myself. It's, is it possible to file a bypass continuation before normal entry, uh, entry um, after a PCT? And the answer to that is yes, just like you can file your national stage entry earlier than the deadline, 20 or 30 months, you can also file a bypass continuation earlier. And so that is one of the um, considerations for when you might want to pursue a continuation, uh, bypass continuation is that you can um, initiate a uh, U.S. continuation application earlier based upon that original PCT priority. So I think that's it, Luigi, for, for timing. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm afraid um, we've only been able to touch the surface of the, the, the questions that, the volume of questions that we've received, um, but we are going to have to um, end the webinar now. And so I'd like to uh, thank everybody for joining us for today's webcast uh, entitled, Things Are Different Over There, Avoiding Misunderstandings and Pitfalls to Maximize Value When Prosecuting Patents on Both Sides of the Pond. Um, just to remind all attendees that this presentation will be available on demand in the next week, uh, and we will be sending out an email uh, with the access link. So if any of you weren't able to join us live today or had to leave earlier, you'll still have an opportunity to catch up with the, uh, with the on-demand video. So this concludes today's webcast, and once again, thank you to everybody for attending, and thank you to Yelena and uh, Michelle for your interesting presentations, and uh, we look forward to, to, um, to, to our next webinar.